Thanks for that, Jane. So, uh, I haven't seen anyone greet each other with a holy kiss yet, but we have read God's word. And it is good, isn't it? It is good. Uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that when we gather, you are with us. God, we thank you that when we listen, you speak to us. God, and we pray as we gather this morning and as we open your word, that we would open our hearts and our ears. That you would open our hearts and our ears and our eyes that we might see your beauty. That we might hear you speak to us individually and as a church community. And that we might be equipped and empowered to live into the patterns and the, the ways of Jesus. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, as many of you know, uh, August 2022, I went with a bunch of guys and, and hiked up Mount Feathertop. Uh, I figure you, most of you have heard some of this before, but I worked pretty hard for this illustration. And I didn't manage to get airlifted off the mountain, uh, so I figure I can share it again. It was uh, Thursday night, uh, middle of winter, and after a night uh, in a caravan park of thunderstorms, we arrived. The base of the mountain, Mount Feathertop, ready to start hiking. 11.3 kilometres with an elevation of 1,200 metres to a place called Feather Federation Hut. As you can imagine, because of the thunderstorms, it was already wet and muddy when we set off. <laughs> you, you can see this is a little further on the journey. And it didn't take long for me to realise as we made our way up that my one or two training walks in Mount Dandenongs hadn't uh, prepared me for what lay ahead. And so by the time we reached a halfway point, which could have been around there some way, I was struggling. I was out of energy. I was running out of water because I left my second bottle behind to try and save a bit of weight. Uh, I think we had enough food, though, to last us for a week. And I have to admit, I was starting to doubt that I would make it to the top as many friends and families uh, anticipated. <laughs> and I wasn't the only one. Uh, by the time we stopped about halfway up to put on our snowshoes to transition from uh, the, snow, uh, the ice and the mud to the snow, I thought I was done. I was con seriously considering turning around. And so I decided to do what uh, any good hiker does when things get tough. I decided to whinge and moan without ceasing. With the weight I was carrying, I think it was 25 kilos, the feeling of exhaustion, all these negative thoughts that were running around my mind, the only thing that stopped me from turning around and giving up, the only thing that helped me get to the top of this mountain was this steady stream of encouragement from Art. We got this. We can do this. We're almost there, two-thirds, two kilometres, one kilometre, 500 metres to go until finally we arrived. After six hours of hiking through the mud and the ice and the snow, I'll never forget the incredible feeling of coming to the hut, Federation Hut, the exhilaration and relief as we made it to our destination and I was where everyone had been waiting for longer than I cared to remember. And as I thought back on this experience... And the challenge is that it made me, that we made it through to reach, well, at least I made it through to reach the destination. It struck me how important it is for us to have people around us, people who are willing to walk with us and to support and encourage us, to help us maintain a healthy and hopeful perspective so we can continue to move forward no matter what life throws at us. And very much the same is true, isn't it, when it comes to our Christian walk? When it comes to following Jesus, the reality is we live in a fallen and broken world where there, we are constantly facing questions and, and challenges and hardships. And, and so we need people, other followers of Jesus, who can journey with us, who can keep encouraging us and who can point us toward Jesus. And in many senses, as we look at this passage, the last chapter, as we've made our way through Thessalonians, that is Paul's focus on being the church. 
As we prepare to make this transition between uh, the first Paul's first letter and his second letter to the Thessalonian church, it's important to remember he's writing to a church, isn't he, that's facing incredible hardship and persecution. So when Paul arrived in Thessalonica, he was there for three weeks. He spent three weeks reasoning in the synagogue, three weeks to establish a church in Jason's home, three weeks before he is driven out of town. And the believers were left to fend for themselves. As he writes, it's been 12 months And so naturally, you can imagine, Paul as a pastor is concerned for this church. And so he sends his co-worker Timothy to check what's happening, and he receives this encouraging report that the church is flourishing. The testimony, in fact, has gone out to the surrounding churches as an encouragement to them, the churches across the region. And, And so like any good pastor, Paul decides to write, to write to encourage this church, to encourage them to continue building one another up, we heard last week, as they were already, in fact, doing. And as he writes, Paul has one single focus, one single purpose. And we discover at verse 23 where he prays. He said, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. If you remember, every chapter in Paul's letter to the church in Thessalonica, it ends with a reference to the return of Jesus, the coming of the Lord, as he calls it. And now as we come to this final chapter, as he looked forward in preparing this church for Jesus' return, Paul pauses to pray for the believers. And just as he did in chapter 3, he prays, one, that they would be strengthened, that they would be sanctified through and through, that they would be completely transformed from the inside out so that when Jesus returns, how would they be found holy and blameless? Not because of what they have or haven't done, but because of what God has done in them. See, Paul knows that God is the one who calls us. He is the one who saves us. That God is the one who can sanctify us by his spirit. And yet, as we see in this passage, we have a part to play. Paul's heart is that God would bring this good work he began in the Thessalonian church to completion. That the church will continue growing, that the believers would finish well. And to ensure this happens, he calls them to follow the patterns. These patterns that will keep them grounded and keep them growing. So they'll be found holy and blameless at the return of Jesus. Now Paul gives us, doesn't he, quite a long list of instructions. But rather than wade through one at a time, we're going to break this down in in terms of three key themes, three patterns Paul calls us to follow in order to aid this process of sanctification, this transformation of us into the image of Jesus. He says to lean into community, to worship continually, and to embrace a spirit of prophecy. We pick this up, verse 12, the first pattern Paul calls us to adopt in this process of sanctification is to lean into community. Or more so to even foster this growing sense of family. Notice how Paul begins, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard because of their, in love, because of their work. Live at peace with each other. Now, if you remember a few weeks ago when we looked at this, uh, earlier in this letter, we mentioned that after Paul refocuses his mission in Acts, after Acts 17, he contextualizes. As he refocuses his mission to the Gentiles, he contextualizes. And so rather than use a language of rabbi and discipleship, he embraces this language of family. And so as Paul frames up this section about relationships with the church, he doesn't talk about pastors or leaders. He doesn't talk about leaders or volunteers. He models our relationships in the church around the language of family. He calls us brothers and sisters because this is what our relationships should be like. Now, as much as we're related by blood, aren't we, in the church? The blood of Jesus. The the image that came to mind in order to help us adopt these patterns and foster a sense of family uh, led to a a couple of my siblings who have done foster caring. 
Uh, some of these kids who come into their homes are from pretty difficult situations, pretty dysfunctional families. And, and one of them was so used to feeding himself, his diet consisted of two things, the most healthy options you could have, uh, chips from McDonald's and frozen chicken nuggets that were still frozen from the freezer. And so as he joined my sister's family, they needed to establish some healthy structures and and patterns to help guide their relationships, how he treated them as foster parents and, and how he interacted with their kids as brothers and sisters and in order to help him settle into life in the family. And in many senses, that's what Paul is doing here. He's outlining these patterns that help foster healthy relationships in the church. In the first section, he looks at those who are over us. I find it really interesting that instead of talking about pastors and leaders, as we often do when we talk about those over us, Paul frames this more in a sense of spiritual parents. The idea of spiritual parents we looked at in chapter 2, you see that more than a title, pastor or leader, spiritual parents are those who are defined by what they do. So he said, those who work hard among us, those who admonish us, those who nurture us in our relationship with Jesus. And as parents, he calls us to love them, to respect them, to live at peace with them. God places spiritual parents in the church. People around us who will encourage us and invest in us, encourage us in our relationship with Jesus. And rather than push them away, He calls us to listen to them, to learn from them, to show love and respect for them. And the second part of uh, this section on community is about our patterns as siblings, as brothers and sisters in Christ. He says, and we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage those who are disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong. But always strive to do what is good for each other, and for everyone else. So rather than just the parents, placing all the responsibility on the parents, he calls us as brothers and sisters to minister to one another. He places responsibility back into the hands of the church family and calls us to minister to one another according to each other's needs. To say if someone's being disruptive, if they're causing issues in the church, we need to warn them. If someone is feeling disheartened and discouraged and struggling in their faith, we need to seek to encourage and strengthen them. If someone is weak and in need of help, we need to come alongside them and and start to serve and and to equip and to build them up. If someone is looking to retaliate, uh, we need to intervene because two wrongs don't make a right. And in all these things, as we seek to minister to one another, we are called to be patient to support the growth of the individual to act for the good of the wider church that's how we foster this this growing sense of family that Paul talks about and it's one of the things I love about this church I know when people come in even if I don't get to meet them there will be a welcome they will be welcomed in warmly But more than just a welcome, there is this growing sense of community, this growing participation in the ministry of the churches. And so in many senses, as I read these verses, I read them as a great encouragement to us here as a church. But, yes, there is a but, the challenge for us, my sense, is to go deeper. To go deeper in our relationships with one another so we can minister as people need. You know, as much as we're constantly taught to be more dependent and individualistic and to keep people at a distance, the church is meant to be different to our society. The church is meant to be a family, a family of believers, a place where we can be ourselves, where we can share our struggles, and where we can receive support and encouragement because that's what a family does. We minister to each other in the ways that we need. And don't get me wrong, there is no such thing as a perfect family. There is no such thing as a perfect church. We are not a perfect church. And so this sense of family is something we want to continue to foster, to keep working to create a culture where we can go deeper with one another, where it's okay to share our struggles, not necessarily Sunday morning in front of the whole church, but with various people who we have connected with. 
where we can share our struggles and be loved and cared for. Where we can speak into each other's lives with truth and love, words, encouragement and accountability. And most of all, where we continue in, in no matter what situation we find ourselves to point one another to Jesus. That's what we need, isn't it? That's what I need in my own life. That's what family can do that no other network of people can. They can encourage, can hold us accountable. They can minister to us in the ways that we need that encourage and inspire us to, to continue going deeper in our relationship with Jesus. Which brings us to our second pattern in this process or pattern of sanctification, our worship. And when it comes to the church, sometimes we have this habit, I think, of separating. I do my life with people over here and then I, I come and I, I worship over here and, and we separate these two parts of our life. And yet it's interesting when it comes to our sanctification that Paul focuses first on our relationships with each other. He calls us to love and serve one another and then he calls us to worship, to worship continually. Verse 16, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. When it comes to God's will, I don't know about you, but usually we think in terms of God's will for me, don't we? What is God's will for my life? And it usually gets reduced down to all these material things, where we live, how many kids we're going to have, if we get married, the kind of work we do, the kind of church we're going to go to, the ministry we're going to serve in. And all these things are important and all these things are decisions we include God in. But I find it interesting that Paul says that God's will is so much bigger than this. That God's will is for us to live with a spirit of worship, where we worship Jesus in the morning and the evening, at work and at home, as we worship him by rejoicing, by praying, by giving thanks, and we worship him no matter where we are, no matter what is going on in our lives, no matter what situation we find ourselves in. That is God's will for you and for me. I don't know about you, but if you're anything like me, I don't always feel like praying. I don't always feel like rejoicing. I don't always feel like giving thanks. And so as much as we talk about worshipping continually, as though it happens naturally, something, it is something I find that can be profoundly challenging to do. As most of you know, I start my morning routine with a prayer walk. I come in and I put my bags at the desk in my office and then I go for a walk around the streets of our community, around the church property. And to be honest, I don't always feel like going. There's mornings I feel tired and anxious and under pump with a to-do list. There are mornings, some days, where the Melbourne weather leads a lot to be desired. And so on mornings when it's raining or there's a wind chill factor of zero, or I've just got things that I want to get on with. I'll skip my walk. I'll miss this time of prayer and worship in preparation for today. And as a couple of, after a couple of days, I have to admit, I start to notice the difference. The difference it makes when I start my day with Jesus. My heart is more settled. My mind is more focused. I'm more aware and attentive to the Spirit's presence and His guidance as I go about my day. That's what we need to understand when it comes to worship. To worshiping continually because in a post-truth generation, far too often our feelings are more influential than the facts. And so depending on our situation, depending on the frame of mind we're in, uh, sometimes we find ourselves struggling to worship. Sometimes when we come to church on a Sunday, we're not really here and ready to worship. Sometimes as we go throughout our week, we struggle to worship continually. And so more than a feeling, we need to know this call to worship is based on a decision. A decision to hold on to the truth, no matter what life has thrown at us, to hold on to the truths that God loves us. 
that he has shown us and extended to us his grace in Jesus, that he will never leave or forsake us, even in the midst of the chaos, that somehow God is working everything together for the good of those love, who love him. And if we hold on to these truths, no matter what we feel, we can choose to worship him. To worship him regardless of our situation. And you know, as we make that decision again and again, in the morning, in the evening, at home or at work, in every situation, as we choose to worship Jesus, regardless of our circumstances, our hearts begin to follow our heads. And that's when we start to worship continually. Because we are more aware of God's presence and his guidance throughout our day. And we're ready to rejoice in the good things as gifts from God. To pray through the problems and decisions that we face as we go throughout our day. To give thanks for the opportunities and the interactions that we have enjoyed throughout our day. That's what Paul is talking about. To worship continually. That's what it means to follow Jesus. That's what it means to live and be led by the Spirit. We invite Jesus. And we acknowledge Jesus. And we embrace what he is doing in and around us. Every day, in every moment, at every opportunity. So when it comes to this process of sanctification, when it comes to being found holy and blameless before Jesus when he returns, we need to foster this deepening, growing sense of family. We are brothers and sisters who minister to each other. We need to worship continually. Inviting God to be present and his spirit to be active in our everyday experiences. And the third and final pattern is as a church, we need to be open to the presence and the power of the spirit. Verse 19, do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. I don't know about you, but when I hear this word quench, my mind automatically thinks about water. And I might just do that. Quenching our thirst. We get a drink to quench our thirst, which is a good thing, right? But Paul uses this word, quench, in a metaphorical sense. The only time it's used this way in the New Testament, he uses it to create this image of a, a flame, of putting out a lamp, of extinguishing a fire. And so this phrase could be more accurately translated as stop putting out the Spirit's fire. Which is pretty appropriate, isn't it? Because when it comes to the Holy Spirit, one of the images the Bible often uses to describe the person and the presence and the purifying work of the Spirit is a flame or a fire. The tongues of fire on the day of Pentecost. Now when it comes to the Spirit as fire, one of the things I've learned from Survivor or the, the latest season of Alone, uh, these wilderness shows, is how hard it can be to get a fire started. And how easy it is for a fire to go out. And when it comes to these shows, they don't create fire, do they? All the contestants, they get to bring these different uh, utensils in order to create a spark that leads to ignition. And so they don't create fire. Their job is to create an environment where that spark can take hold, where a fire can start to burn. And more often than not, that takes time. It takes time to get some leaves, to dry the kindling, because a lot of these shows are in snow and ice, uh, to gather some timber, and once they finally get a fire going, sometimes it takes them days. All it takes is a moment. You turn your back, you forget to feed it, a gust of wind comes and the fire is gone. I'm pretty sure the spirit is a little more robust than some of these fires on these reality shows. The reality is we can quench the Spirit in the church. We can extinguish His flame in our hearts. 
And we can do that by closing ourselves off to prophecy or giving into temptation and sin. Now, when it comes to sin and evil, most of us are usually in agreement. It's something we should avoid. And as much as we try and overcome it at our own strength, often we end up giving into temptation, doing things we don't want to do. Why? Because we don't rely on the Spirit. We rely on ourselves. When we try and stand, when we try and make decisions, when we try and resist temptation in our own strength, we often end up quenching the Spirit. That's what Paul says. But we also quench the Spirit when we ignore or dismiss or despise the words that God himself wants to impress on our hearts. That's what prophecy is about. When it comes to prophecy, we often, more often than not, we think about predicting the future, don't we? Prophecy is those people who tell you what's about to happen in the future. In fact, maybe that's what's going on in the church in Thessalonica. Some of them were predicting the day of Jesus' return. And that's why Paul calls them to test the prophecy. To test what people are saying against the Bible. To listen for the witness of the Spirit. To hold fast to what is good. And to avoid that which is evil. And I know... I know we have all seen the excesses. We've all seen that the prophetic gift used and abused. And far too often, my sense is it has caused us to close ourselves off to the gift and to the giver, to to the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm convinced that we as a church, and we have shared this, we are in a season of rediscovering what it means to live and be led by the Spirit. And God is calling us to open ourselves afresh. To open our hearts and minds to the presence and the power of the Spirit. To make room for His gifts. As it says in Corinthians, even particularly the gift of prophecy. And I don't want to presume where that will take us when we open ourselves to the Spirit. But I believe that God will speak to us. And God will lead us. And God will do things that maybe surprise us from time to time by his spirit. And we need to be open. We need to be open to God moving by his spirit. We need to be open to listening and and discerning these voices of wisdom. And we need to be discerning. So we can take hold of that which is good. That which is from God. So we can respond to what he is saying. What he is doing in and around us. So that we truly can become the hands and the feet of Jesus. As we come to a close, I want to take you back for a moment to my expedition. A mountaintop experience, this moment of exhilaration and rejoicing as we reached our destination, Federation Hut. But more than just a moment of exhilaration, this was the beginning of this otherworldly experience. We camped up there for two nights, and, and on the first night, more than 20, uh, 40 centimetres of snow fell. In fact, it was middle of the night, it was quite hard to get out of the tent, <laughs> to get the tent open. And so we woke up to this pure, pristine, absolutely stunning new reality. And the beauty of this destination made all the pain and suffering worthwhile. And that's what Paul wants us to realize when it comes to our Christian journey. That when we reach our destination, when we arrive At eternity with Jesus, all of the difficulties and challenges and hardships will fade into the background compared to the beauty and the majesty of an eternity in the presence of Jesus when he comes to establish his reign and rule on earth. It's a vision Paul has. That is his desire for the church. That is his heart for for the believers, that they would endure the hardship 
knowing that God has something so much more beautiful planned. And in order to navigate the, the challenges of a fallen, broken world and be found holy and blameless when Jesus returns, he calls us to follow these predictable patterns, to foster this growing sense of family. And more than come and go on a Sunday morning, we connect deeply and intimately. We share our passions, where we, we share our struggles, where we encourage and support and serve one another and build each other up as we point each other to Jesus. We need to foster this deeper sense of family. We need to, to worship, to learn what it means to worship, continue to invite Jesus into our everyday experiences, into our homes, into our streets, into our workplaces, into our conversations, into our projects that we're, we're managing, into the people and the relationships that we make, the people that we meet. We need to acknowledge God in those moments. To rejoice in his goodness. To pray for people in those opportune moments. To love and serve those around us as we seek to reflect Jesus. We need to foster a sense of family. We need to keep learning what it means to worship continually in every moment, in every day, and in every situation. And we need to be more open to the presence and the power of the Spirit working in us and through us. So we can try and change our souls. But as we said at the start, God is the one who by His Spirit is at work in us and wants to work through us. He works in us to make us, to remake us into the image of Jesus and work through us that we may bear witness to our friends and our family and all those around us. And so I trust that in this season of waiting, knowing that one day Jesus is coming, that like the church in Thessalonica, we would embrace these predictable patterns. We would connect deeply and seek to foster this sense of family here at Campbell Baptist. That we would worship continually in every day, in every moment. And that we would truly be open to what God wants to do by His Spirit in us and through us. In preparation for that moment when we are found in His presence, holy and blameless. In that preparation for that moment when Jesus returns and establishes His kingdom and His rule on earth as in heaven. And we, as those who are holy and blameless, will be with him. Everything that has been will fade into insignificance as we stand before Jesus, our King, as we live in his presence for eternity. And you know, like Paul, I can't help but wonder if that is the key thing that matters now every day will take care of itself eternity with Jesus what matters most I trust we will do whatever it takes to live into that moment would you pray with me Heavenly Father we are so grateful For the promises that you have made. We are so grateful as we look around our world, as we see the hurt and the brokenness and the chaos around us. This is not our forever home. But as you have said to your disciples, you are preparing a place where we will spend eternity in your presence. And God, we ask that that promise would guide and shape our lives today.
He would move us not to to go about our lives on autopilot, but to truly be aware and attentive. To the voice of your spirit and to the, the words of your people. That we might live together and worship you. in every situation, in every season as we go about our lives. God, we ask that the work you have begun in us, you would see through to completion. Because we long to stand holy and blameless before our Lord and our King, Jesus. So God, we invite your spirit to continue to be at work in us and through us. In preparation for that moment. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.